based upon forgot about uh, that <laughs> uh got it it's recorded so i'll i'll use proper king's english when i speak um the emphasis was to try to create some guidance some guidelines that shows the rating agency that we as a group, the advisory committee, have some path to follow. That path can come in various forms. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be voted on and approved. And I'm reluctant because, again, we're, we're coming out of and going into the next pandemic, which alters things. And it does not give us flexibilities to have hard-coded policies and procedures to follow. So the intent when we first started this, and, and Heidi may agree or disagree, um, was to codify best practices for a small town like Sherburne into the future of how the finance committee, the advisory committee should work, follow, and making decisions and advising on the budget. So I'm, I'm not hung up on the technical aspect of who approves it, who doesn't approve it, because uh, as Mark and Heidi has mentioned, a few years ago, the select board voted on this. I've never seen it until Heidi dug it out of the treasure trove of wherever Sherburne treasure troves uh, dwell and said, hey, look what we have. This also is a path for orientation for Dan and the next advisory members to come by and, and, and take a look to see what should we be doing? And, and what paths should we be following and what best practices are out there. And so it's a codification of all that, what we've had in the past, presently what some of the best business, best practices for municipalities are. And as a group, I, I think we should all weigh in because it's a living document. It should change. I, I believe it should change every year. And so, Given that preference, um, we can decide on, on how to deal with this, but it's, it's definitely um, the yellow brick road that you, we should follow to help Sherburn make the best decisions during budget time. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd like I, I like your explanation of it, Peter. I mean, the way that I had imagined this was that, you know, essentially, hopefully we've all read through the draft and may or may not have any comments or changes, but that um, today I was hoping that advisory would be able to vote to approve, uh, you know, whatever draft we come up with. Uh, you know, knowing that that it's not binding, but it does send the message to the town and to the select board that, hey, look, advisory, uh, we looked over this, we made the changes that we felt were relevant for the current sort of fiscal um, climate, and these are our recommendations, and now we pass it on to you to also approve it and basically, you know, sort of adopt this as uh, accepted um, financial policies. Um, so, so that's, I, I did imagine that we would vote on this and then I would send this to the select board um, for them to discuss and vote on at whichever, whichever meeting they felt was uh, appropriate. Um, does that, does that mesh with you? Well, I, I just want to be cautious that once approved, we always want to retain the flexibility to have our guidance be in real time versus a dated document that of, of best practices. And so 
as guidance, I always said we were executing this by performance. We have a living document, and, and I'm, I'm thinking that standard and pours is in front of me. Uh, we have a living document that we are amending as time goes on, and this is the, the path, this is the guidance that advisory follows when giving guidance. And what I don't want it to be is, is a tool to achieve other objectives because there's a stale provision in there that we may have overlooked or times have changed that would justify something that's not in the best interest of the town going forward. That's why I'm, I'm leery of, of saying, I, this is written in stone, this is what we do. But to share, and again, the original audience was for Standard & Poor's, the, the credit rating, rating, which as a reaction to our triple A rating, which I believe is the highest, they had some deficiencies that we could work on. And so we focused on them and put into, uh, on paper, some improvements. So we're not in a bad place, we're in a good place, setting out a path that would always keep us on that path to be a highly rated uh, debt uh, raising entity where investors want to put their money and uh, the market is very liquid for us, which I believe it is and has always will be. Well, Peter, what if right at the beginning of our policy or our document, we just summarize the essence of what you just communicated. We could just say these are these are best practices that we've learned over time. And we consider this a living, breathing document subject to change based on what's ever most appropriate or best for our, you know, our town. And, and then list out what our best practices are. We can change them anytime we want. That's a flex. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mark. I, I agree. That that has always been the intent is to try and um, highlight, illustrate the path we've been down, the lessons we've learned over the 365 years that we've been doing this, uh, not us personally, but the town of Sherburn, and that it is fluid. And so I, I, I agree that we should have that um, mention in there at the, at the uh, beginning of the document. Let me ask a couple of questions of Heidi. Um, Heidi, does it, does it matter to you or does it help your situation vis-a-vis -vis, um, S&P? If this has been formally approved by advisory, does it does it give you does it give it a little more oomph, and does that help you if it's been voted on? Yes, S and P wanted to know they didn't want an informal policy. They wanted to know what formally what formal policies we have that were adopted. I mean, ultimately, it's the select board that creates a document, but it's being it comes from advisory to the select board. So a vote from advisory actually sends the message to the select board that this is. Uh, something that's been vetted and approved and that would help the select board make the final decision to actually create a formal policy. Um, it, it's something that is in one of their criteria of what they weigh and we will need to get as many positive features on our, our plate to tip the scales in our favor to maintain AAA. Um, I, I think it's, we can just say it's, an updated one on the fiscal policy that's already a formal policy because I did find a select board vote. Um, and I was hoping to try at least get one more, uh, Mark put together a great reserve policy, one more that we could show progress on from a year ago when these were deficiencies. Um, actually right now I've got a call, it's gonna be tentatively scheduled. Our aim is to have it on September 27th with Standard & Poor. Um, which only leaves me September 9th and September 23rd to get select board meetings for any of these to be approved in order to have it available to say from S&P, oh, there have been changes from last year because right now there's nothing I can say from our call from last year that we improved on, on what their recommendations were. 
So well, yes, yes, you can, Heidi. You, you can say that we have a document that's in progress, and that's that's what I would say. You could say whatever yeah. you want. Um, yeah. Have we regressed from any of the other stellar points that got us a AAA rating that we should focus on, or is it still the deficiencies from last year? that are still the remaining deficiencies and we're just trying to close that gap. Because there's not a triple A plus 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 that we're going for, it's just to maintain the, the, right. the rating. And, and, and they did tell me that we were borderline. They didn't know if they were gonna give us triple A last year, you know, and we did squeak by and they agreed to give us triple A. They told me they were gonna monitor us um, that we could lose it. Uh, and the concern, the biggest concern I have is we again on the audit show a negative fund balance and that's something i've worked with deb on we were they they thought we'd be positive this year and we're not as much but that's going to be our big issue or hurdle to go through so right. i'm trying and, and and that's that's very helpful information that's very different from the words on the black characters on the white page the the fund deficit is that, and again, um, I'm quoting um, Dave, um, that because of COVID, we had to have some deficiencies that, that error when we crossed the, the fiscal year um, was, a, and, and, and I don't remember the specifics, but we thought we could spend something because of COVID and then it, uh, occurred in the next year and we had to use reserve funds which dropped our fund rating and again I'm, I apologize for the quasi technicality um, in, in this discussion but if it's the net fund that we're being dinged on we're not addressing that policy specifically in in these um policies and procedures, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, we're just giving some best practices that would eventually contribute to a profit, uh, speaking just in, in, in basic um, p &L terms, where that profit goes into owner's equity, and that equity on a municipal perspective is that fund balance. Our fund balance has been decreasing and so they're saying, well, you're not making any money. You're, you're chewing into your equity, and that's not good. And we may think it's good every time we make a vote, we decide to transfer funds and to use free cash and all of these um, items that contribute to that net fund decrease that they've witnessed. And I'm, I, I, I'd ask if we know what that number is before we even go in, and then maybe we can alter this document to address that specifically on best practices to improve net funds, which may be a number of things, which may or may not be touched upon already. But that, that's really the, the input that would be helpful. And, and Heidi, you may not know, but if you know of the other towns that have gone through bond um, uh, issuance and had the conversation with S&P, uh, they may have some tips on, on, on how best to um, address that. But I, I, th I think we're taking a broad brush that may have unintended consequences down the road that, again, there are unintended consequences. Uh, Heidi, if we were to consider voting on these policies tonight, uh, it sounds like you did have a chance to comment on them. Do Are you happy with them? I mean, do you think they would satisfy in, in concept? And Peter, I totally hear you that, you know, we may want to change them in the future or even, you know, in the near future. But, but Heidi, do you think that they would help? Um, and do you think that substantively they would um, address some of the concerns that S&P had if we were to, at this point, formally put them in place? 
I think yes, they're going to help. I think Mark's suggestion of how you say right in the beginning, these policies are to be reviewed annually to make sure they're up to date. I mean, they should be living documents, as, as Peter mentioned. And I think that would be that would help if, if that's incorporated into each document that we do. Um, I, I think I still kind of feel there are two different issues, the fund balance one, which is a huge one. And, you know, they have certain factors that they look at. The policies is one of the factors in the management. Um, and I'm not, I'm not an accounting specialist, so Deb is aware and is going to be looking into some of this to figure out what happened with the fund balance. Um, Peter, what you were talking about, that transfer actually is for FY21. The audit is FY20. That we had the def that we show the deficit, so that transfer hasn't even come up in their audit yet. Um, that won't be till next year. Uh, so, do that. we know the answer? Do we know the answer for 2020? Whether our fund balance and I may know this if I had looked at all my emails, but do we do we know if the fund balance increased? Because it, it decreased. We know the so answers. It, it did. Right. It did decrease. Okay. It decreased. So we and. F, they, last year, Standard & Poor brought up FY18 and FY19. In FY19, right. we were negative 1.4 million. FY20, the audit just came back, we're negative 700,000. So the good news is we cut it down in half. You know, unfortunately, we didn't swing it back to be positive again. And I don't know that, again, the accounting reasons of what goes into these, this is something that I think Deb's going to be working on to figure out what went into the numbers and why are we still negative? Well, I, I would suggest that Deb's on that call and that between you and her have an explanation to show us in the best light, even, even if it's a, a negative fund balance, uh, that it's um, the rate of change is positive, meaning that right. it's decreasing. Right. And the reason why, and I think um, they, they mentioned that that's what they do each time they go to the bond. You, you convince them that we're a special town, that the Pilgrims landed in Pilgrim mm -hmm. uh, in Plymouth and Provincetown and, you know, nowhere else in the country is Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Um, but what the journey we've been on, it's positive. Because again, even the black characters on, on, on the policy we're, we're deciding, what really matters is follow the money. Right. Is it improving and why is it improving? And will that improvement continue? And then that future uh, forecast is based upon the lanes we've developed, which is the document we have here that shows we're adding to that net fund balance. We're adding to the equity. We want to, and again, it's tough because it's balancing and, and they know it. We, we, we don't want to scare residents away. We don't want residents to leave. We want residents to be attracted to our town and invest in our town, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because we do have that high tax burden to overcome, but people still come and pay their taxes. Yes, no, it's, we will be weaving a very positive story and we will be bringing in the sustainability and the other factors that the town's doing. I mean, I've brought in the master plan last year and what, what's consistent with it. You know, we, we do show that on many different facets, we have a very enlightened community and a good group of people working on this. Um, so I, I would, what I'd like to do on this call, I'd like to be able to get one or, or some advisory members to come and be present uh, on the standard and poor call. I'd like to ask the select board member to be present and present as well. Um, so that even on the call, we show a unity of people and um, that they can answer specific questions if it comes up. And I'd offered to be on the call a long time ago when I didn't know any better. <laughs> and now that I know better, I still offer to be on yeah. that call. Um, oh, great. So please include me. Yes. No. So I have, a, I have a clarifying question. Um, so in last year's report, that was when they audited fiscal 18 and 19 and showed a deficit, right? And now you're saying the most recent audit is fiscal 20, still shows a deficit, but a, a smaller one. I mean, just reasonably speaking, 
you know, FY20 happened two years ago. So mm -hmm. they couldn't have expected us to have addressed that deficit in fiscal 20 based on their comments from last year, right? I mean, the, the soonest that we could have done something to try to address that would have been fiscal 21, which just closed, right? Uh, no, I think that some of the reasons for the deficit may be, um, and I, I suspect some of it might have been doing with the library and the borrowing of that time of the times. So, you know, historically the town had not been negative. So to have one year drop so much, um, I, they were Standard Poor's was told that we would be positive this year. This in FY twenty, you know, mm. this was. Because when we had the call, we were having a call in September of, uh, in the start of FY20, and it looked like it was going to be a stronger year. Um, you know, then it, or FY21, but somehow we thought the numbers were going to be coming out differently. Uh, and, and again, I don't understand the, the accounting side of it. So it was not an area that I could answer, but I, I do feel we can easily say we, we cut it in half, we're moving in the right direction. We can talk about the library and the unusual expenses we had that were unanticipated. Um, I think there's things we can minimize and turn to say in general, we, we are creating a healthy town. Yeah, and, and this may be more for Deb, but if we can show on the top line, the revenue is growing and, and we're moderating the rates of increase and we're raising the necessary um, tax revenue. Th that's a good thing because so the demand is there for the, the tax and housing and the stock um, plus the new growth. So that's all positive, positive, positive. Uh, and then explain the anomalies, you know, a library. Uh, it, and again, Heidi, you, you're not going to do this. Um, I'm, I'm sure Deb and um, uh, Dave Williams will, will contribute also. But some of the uniqueness to Sherburn that um, contributes to that AAA rating. And, and I, I will do a, a risk analysis. Even if our rating drops, interest rates are so low now, we're, we're not going to get the bottom that we hit at that point, what was it? What was the last interest rate? It was surprisingly uh, low. Ac ac actually, the one we just did was 0.368. Yeah, a, so we're, 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 we're lulled into a false sense of like, that's going to happen forever. And, right. and so even if we get back to the normal trend of one, 2%, yes, it will cost us more money to, to raise that debt. But it's, it's debt that we know why we incurred because we've been living through that pain of you name, you name the project. Um, and uh, again, the, the rating agency will do whatever the rating agency does based upon what they see in the market and what the market will bear and how we compare with the rest of the market. So if the rest of the market is tanking worse than us, we may still look good. Can I just ask, though, getting back to Steve's, we started this conversation with Steve saying that he had hoped that we might um, approve these policies tonight. And it sounds, Heidi, like last year, S&P was not happy about the negative fund balance. They thought we were going to go positive this year. We didn't. They were also not happy with the fact that we did not have formal policies in place. And there's nothing we can do about the fund balance except try to you know, paint the best picture we can. But there is something we could do about not having formal policies in place. We could adopt these policies tonight. So I guess my question is, you know, do we, what do we have to lose? I mean, Peter, I totally hear your point on we want these to be living, breathing documents, but I'm not sure we have a lot to lose if we just, you know, vote to put them in place and then we can check one of the boxes that S&P asked us to check. But Heidi, I would defer to you as to whether that, you know, analysis is, is makes sense or not. Well, that, that, that's my, that was my rationale. And, and when I spoke with Mark and looked at it, that's what I was hoping that we could check off one of the boxes and, and have something to report and say, yes, we've, we've done this, you know, but I don't want it to be where people are uncomfortable and they think it's, you know, too sad. I, I'm hoping that 
it is a work of living, breathing document to continue, but I do think it would make a difference. Yeah, I, I support voting on it, um, getting the policies in place. I, I don't say, I don't support putting something in there that says we will review these annually because advisory committee changes, you know, we forget one year and then all of a sudden we get a document that's six years old and says we'll review it annually. If we don't put that in there, then it's just stale, but it's not wrong. So, but I, I, I'm fine with voting on it. Um, I read through them, I, I don't have any objections. Could, could put in, in that first paragraph preamble, uh, taking Brendan's point about not that it'll be reviewed annually, but it will be reviewed and updated as needed. Something like that could go in and strikes me as uh, picking up on Jane's point that it, it, it doesn't seem to me there's a lot of downside to approving these if S&P will find it, if, S if, if Heidi thinks S&P would find it helpful, seems like a pretty low cost thing to do to check one of the boxes, as, as Jane said. All right, well, hearing no direct objections other than Peter's uh, hesitation, hesitation <laughs> to, to actually voting on these, I would propose that we kind of go through the task of, of actually on screen going through and if people have any edits and changes they want to make, additions, that we just do it right now on screen and then we can vote and approve them. And then um, we can get this to the select board. And Heidi, did you say that their next meeting well, after this week is gonna be September 9? Is that gonna be the next one? No, there's a meeting on the 26th, but I have an OPEB presentation already bringing up OPEB trust to them that night. So I don't think I can bring up or have another document they'll have time to consider. So yeah. I'm aiming for the September 9th meeting with the fallback of the 23rd because if the s p calls on the 27th at least have if we can get something yeah. from them yeah well i think that I, I think that we can probably approve these tonight so that by on september 9 um you can have these in hand to present to the to the select board um all right i'm gonna i'm gonna share this document and uh we can all let's see here All right. Um, so this is that first one, the financial policies overview. Um, everyone can see this, yes? And the text is large enough for everyone to read. Um, so I'm just gonna go through and we'll make edits, get rid of extra periods. So somewhere in this first paragraph, do we, we wanna say then that, um, this document uh, will be updated uh, as needed, something to that effect. I was thinking in this second paragraph here, I can just tack it onto the end because this introduces what this guidance is. I agree, that's the place to do it, Steve, and as simple as possible. No offense to my corporate attorneys who are on this call. How's that? This document may be updated as needed. All right. Um, is everybody okay with the remainder of this uh, first, the introductory section? So I have just a quick newbie question. Um, and I'm sure it's the way it is because it's supposed to be, but there was just one thing that I wondered about, which is, in that third paragraph, it's fully understood that town meeting retains the legal right to appropriate funds and incur debt. Uh, you know, I just answered my own question. Never mind. Let's move on. Sorry. Great. Do not be shy about asking questions, though. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm good on that. Um, all right, guiding principles. Um, these look pretty straightforward. Just going to make this edit that Word wants me to make. And I'll just make sure there's a period at the end of every sentence. Um, uh, I guess number six, there was no uh, colon sub subheading. Is that was that intentional? Because accounting, auditing, and financial reporting is straightforward enough by itself. 
could add words like maintain highest standards for accounting and reporting, just something really simple. Yeah, uh, you have to maintain the government accounting standards. So there's, there's a word for that, which it's not gap, it's GASPY, G-A-S-B-Y, yes. thank you, G-A-S-B-Y, general accounting there's, standards for... There's no, there's no Y, it's just G-A-S-B. G-A-S-B. All right, so can somebody compose the sentence for me? To be or not to be, that is, no. Um, on, let me just follow along. Uh, we were on six. Yeah. So it was maintain high standards of accounting and reporting in accordance with GASB, G, capital G A S B Y. Wait, no Deb, y. Deb just said there's no Y though, right? No Y. G A S B. Okay. G A S B. Uh, should I clarify what that stands for? No, no, because because it's it we wouldn't be a town if we didn't know what that means. Hey, okay. can I just point, point four there, Steve Sai, um, on the investment management? Yeah, isn't it maintain policies pertain, pertaining to investment? So that's just saying that we're going to maintain policies. Nothing about the policies we maintain. I'm wondering, is that sufficient? Is that the goal here of these? As a guiding principle and goal, maintaining a policy doesn't seem like much of a principle or goal. Would uh, that be a cross reference to the? To the reserves policy that um, or, that had also have, been circulated. Do we have an investment policy statement? And, and I should apologize. This is the first time I'm seeing these. Uh, I might have missed earlier emails. No, and and I thought um, investment policy was very regulated. We had to invest in the safest of safe uh, money markets. Um, so yeah, because lower means, down here we do was, flesh it out, right? We flesh okay, out yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thing. thank you. So it's very prescriptive. Yeah. So I think we'll. I think I'm okay. So leaving we, that. we 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 can't buy like Chinese companies and have, they're volatile now. And I'm not making a statement on anything international, but uh, you can invest in volatile assets. All right. Are we okay with this list, which will subsequently get fleshed out later? Yes. All right. Revenue and expenditure. All right. Any, any edits on this page? And in, in the, the, just to give uh, background, color and texture, it was some of the best practices that are generic to all towns. Um, and so if we see something that may not apply directly to Sherburn specifically today, um, that, that would be helpful. And at least when I read this, it all seemed to apply to Sherburn. Good. All right. Happy with revenue. And expenses. All right. So now I'll get my, my newbie question in. In uh, item K, when it notes that advisory will make periodic assessments about whether encumbrances will deviate from short and long-term trends observed. Maybe that's the standard language used. It surprised me that it didn't say, um, you know, we'll track, um, uh, you know, we'll track expenses as, in, unless encumbrances is really meant to be a synonym for expenses. It just seemed like encumbrances was a narrower had a narrower meaning than would just a general term like expenses. And, and if Deb's on the call, I'd ask her to, um, 
encumbrances are the, the municipal financing equivalent of you encumber funds to pay something. So it's- So it's, if that's it's the right term, term, that's great. And then I learned a new, a new bit of vocabulary. Yeah, a lot of times you think of encumbrances at the end of the year, like if the, the, that they're incurred during one fiscal year, but not paid until the next fiscal year. But it can also be, you know, that it's just encumbered or reserved. But when you read the sentence, expenses would probably be a better word there than encumbrances. Then let's change it. All right. Because that's that's the monthly variance analysis. That that was the um, essence of that. Is that you you provide our uh, annual uh, year to date spending compared to budget and um, whether we're above or below. Right. That is a, a a type of management that the town and the finance committee can monitor month to month to make sure that the accuracy and integrity of our budget was in line with what is actually happening during the year. Agreed. Great. All right, moving on to budget planning and process. Um, this all seemed pretty straightforward to me. I did have a question about H uh, enterprise funds. This is just my own ignorance is what is what is an enterprise fund and 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 how does that work in terms of this as about reimbursing the general fund, whatnot? Yeah, we don't have any enterprise funds. A lot of towns like have that water and sewer where they send their own bills and pay their own things. That's an enterprise fund. we We currently don't have any enterprise funds. Okay. So that was a best practice that I, I knew we didn't, but may have some, you know, sex appeal to standard and pores. Yeah, no, I, I think that's good. Um, there is, there's a thing going on right now regarding um, stormwater management, uh, part of that MS4 permit that, that Jean Colleen's kind of been um, uh, bringing up every year. Um, but there's a uh, an EPA mandate to reduce um, phosphorus runoff, um, and you know we a lot of the town is in the Charles River watershed, so um, we ha we are in a uh, a 20 year mandate to reduce um, phosphorus runoffs, and uh, there's a lot of talk right now about how to do it and how much it's going to cost, and it's going to cost a lot of money, um, and so one of the ways that um, we're talking about possibly uh, paying for it is actually going to be to um, establish an enterprise fund. That's one of the reasons why I was asking about it. So I was like, oh, enterprise fund that just came up last week also. And I didn't know what that was either. Um, so I think there is the distinct possibility that the town may end up establishing an enterprise fund sometime in the next um, few years. This is just so a in minute. this case, we, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, Jane, no go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, Peter. No, 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 this is the case where we can lead um, into the future, is that if we don't have it now, we do set some um, guardrails around how the fund, uh, best practices for an enterprise fund. That's, that's my only comment. Oh, that's good, I think. Jane, what were you gonna say? Just a nit on um, item G, I, I don't, I think the operational budget goes to the capital budget committee in it. Oh, that's Sounds true. Yeah. I, it's written like it does. Yeah, I noticed that also when I first read it and I didn't. Uh, um, 
So let's see, what is a non-clunky way of rewording this? Well, we've already talked about advisory looking at the budget. So could we just say capital budgets will be presented to the advisory and capital budget committee? Anyway, what, did it say somewhere else already that operating budget will be presented to advisory? I thought on B. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. All right. So, yeah. Great. Good, thanks. Good catch. All right, anything else on this page? All right. I through N. I, this one M made me, made me a little bit uneasy. <laughs> um, is it, is it, is it typical to have a practice like this sort of codified to say that we are going to specifically basically try not to have benefited positions? It's position control, and again, it, it, it's common to, once you hire someone, that verbal contract is you will work X number of hours and maintain that. And it's very easy to abuse the individual and say, work 40 hours, even though you're part-time. Um, so it was, it was trying to address that, that um, again, when you, department heads, when you hire someone, it is for a set budgeted position and you, you stick with it. Steve, I have I, the same reaction as you. I wonder if we could solve mm -hmm. for that by just taking out the second line and the part of the third line that's before the period. So in other words, we would say careful study will be exercised before creating new positions or increasing existing positions. And then emphasis will be placed on improving individual and work group productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in other words, just take out the part that specifically so, uh, seems to be talking about, you know, keeping people under 20 hours. Right. That's, I, I have no problem with saying, uh, you know, you have a contract, this is what you're supposed to do, this is how many hours and stick with it. I have no problem with that. I don't, I, I, I fully understand the reasoning behind uh, why uh, every new hire is 19 hours. Um, I don't. I don't particularly like that practice, even though I understand the the reasoning behind it. Um, especially because I think a lot of positions demand more than 19 hours, and yet we purposely try to try to say we're going to start out by posting this for 19 hours and then see how that goes, and it, it always goes poorly. So, so to have it, again, I think like you had mentioned, Peter, that we don't want this document to be uh, some sort of an outdated um, reasoning behind somebody uh, trying to enact a policy that maybe isn't actually good for the town. I think this is a prime example of that potentially happening. Um, and I, I know that I've heard the select board talk about, oh, we don't want anybody uh, being hired for more than 19 hours. And it just means that we don't get good candidates for any of these positions, you know. Um, so that's well, my hesitation. To, to, be, to, to be fair, the department heads are entrusted with coming up with their labor and um, how to get the job done. And regardless of the number of hours, yes, even though they may be influenced by select board finance it, it's 
really behooves them, and, and, and many have come before us and said, no, I need this position because that's what's required. Um, so yes, take out the, the, the numerical aspect of it, but the idea of productivity is, is again appealing and productive because um, nature abhors a vacuum. And if you hire someone for 40 hours, they'll, they'll take up 40 hours. So you, you, as management, you want to create the position that will get the job done in an efficient, productive way. Yes, I agree. I guess my, my general opinion is that it is the job of a combined job of the personnel board, the town administrator and the select board to determine what is the appropriate number of hours for the job that they're asking for, right? It, it, it shouldn't be prescribed in a document that says, and you should try really hard to keep it under 20 hours. It's like that. You know what? If it's a 36 hour position, it's a 36 hour position, you know, and you deal with it. I think that's right, Steve. I, I think um, it's, it's not wise to have this in here. And actually my understanding had been that we were kind of getting away from that behavior anyway. Depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it, as far as the policy goes, like, I think this looks good. Um, we don't yeah, have I'm, I'm all anymore. for, you know, looking at technology and other efficiency tools and, and sure. all of that. But once you decide that you need a person to do a job, you just you you post it for the number of hours that it'll take and you hire for the number of hours it will take so so uh, so can we take out the second line and the first half of the third line yes i think i did I, okay. are you not can you see my screen yeah no i can i just wasn't sure if we had all agreed on that okay So does this look, does this paragraph now look okay to everybody? Steve, two, two nits, um, since you're editing on screen, one needs a period at the end. Uh, oh yeah. And this is a trivial thing, but I would, I would uh, change in the fourth line, maximize productivity. I would change to boost productivity. Hard to know if you're maximizing it or not. You know, clearly we want to do better, but to really say you're going to maximize, hard, hard to know. Spoken like a true economist. There you go. Um, the, the only the other thing that- Management you know, is always trying to maximize productivity. <laughs> so they're, not, they're not doing their job. <laughs> uh, maximize is fine with me if people prefer that. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It, it, it's, it's the same. It's the yeah, same. It's the same it's just... um, my only other sort of hesitation was the town will invest in technology. Uh, I mean, while I am all for it, I am not always sure that, that the town's practices um, go along with the town will always invest in technology. Um, but it does say as appropriate, Steve. So I, I yeah. think that that's probably okay with that qualifier. Sure. I mean, I agree with you. I, I, <laughs> I have the same concern, but. I'm like, yeah, sure the town should, but man, I, when's the last time you walked around town hall and looked at Looked at the so-called no, no. technology in there. <laughs> we, we, we have, we have, and we made steps along the way of giving uh, David the technology um, mantle and um, uh, what was that big ticket item in, in, in permitting and um, moving over to yeah, Vader. No, we've definitely, we've so, I mean, something. there's... And, and we're, we're kind of dragged along whether we want to or not. So it's, we're going to be dragged along into the future. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when I hear Sean Colleen talking about how his laptop literally won't even turn on, I'm like, eh, that's probably not boosting. His well, heart. he probably pushed the wrong button. <laughs> and if Sean's on, maybe he can rebut that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, all right, are we okay?
k up through up through n here. All right, long term planning. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Now B, just to let you guys know, I know, I know we force the expense side on the departments. The revenue side is on us. So uh, when, when we look to a five year rolling, you know, we, we, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And I guess I can say that because this is my last year. Um, but we, we want to project out, and there are models out there available from the state that can use that, which adds, and it's not hard. It's kind of what we've been doing on a year-to-year -year basis, but stretch it out to five years. Um, you know, uh, the um, two and a half plus new growth will give us X amount of revenue. And then the, bud, then the budget makers give us their expense side. So I just want to make everyone aware of that. So I, Peter, I think you and Dan are on capital budget um, this year. Um, so can I sort of vaguely put the two of you as being, you know, the, the ex officio advisory capital budget uh, members to, to start working, working on that aspect of the five-year plan? It's, it's, it's there. And, and so that, that's a good thing, but to truly budget out, and, and maybe we didn't touch upon this, is the, the town five-year plan. So the, the, the operating budget, which includes not just the expense, but the revenue projections out five years, we, tend not to go out that far. So I, I just, and, and again, we, we can, budgets are easy because they're, they're projections. Um, but yes, we will, we, will, we will try that. The long-term five-year uh, revenue and then the budget makers give us both their um, operational and capital requirements for five years. And I'd be very happy to work with Peter on that. Great. Good. Thank you, guys. That's your, that's your first task, Dan. Get Excellent. it done by tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it around in the morning. Um, do you, Peter, do you happen to know is capital budget still um, Joe Shanahan and uh, Corey Lincoln along with you guys? It, it, it's when they invite me and I show up and it, whoever's on the Zoom call, but I believe so it is that, Joe. that they were I can confirm it's Joe. Uh, uh, okay, uh, great. appointed. Yeah. Super. All right, on to four, investment management. Um, and you, Peter, you said that this stuff is all pretty, pretty tightly prescribed, right? Yes, yes, the, the, the state wouldn't allow us to invest in risky stuff. Um, so it's, it's very, so even if we wrote something like we would invest in, uh, you know, hog bellies uh, options. Um, we couldn't do it. Great. Heidi, if you're still on, are you good with the way C is written? That's a lot of information. Um, and I don't know, truthfully, if the whole board wants to be given all our list of securities, which I would get from the investment companies. Um, but I do know that that has been in other towns reports. So I think that's probably where it came from, some, from some other towns, best practices. I think for an annual report, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to, if it should go just to the liaisons rather than the whole committee. Um, I, Heidi, I think to get into the practice of and, and to state to standard and poor's that you are aiming towards the practice of monthly updates with the um, professionals, um, regardless of the audience, would be 
on the trajectory of best practices? I, I don't think the select board will want to hear from me monthly on everything going on in our accounts. Um, and the summary of income in, earned annually, it's mainly gonna be the trust fund will have earnings or I have interest. I don't really have any other major ones. Um, so I'm, if someone wants a monthly report, I'm happy to put it together. I just think it's gonna be a lot of information that people may not look at, so. Well, would you be, I'm assuming the Department of Treasury would be interested in that. So if you're the only customer and it may be just uh, verbal um, or you know an email highlight that we're actually doing best practices is getting our money's worth from those uh, professionals that monitor um, uh, the the um, the funds. We we can we can try it. It's just that's actually going to be a fair amount of work to put it all together. No, well, uh, put, push the work off onto the consultants. Right. Well, they they will put reports, and then I'll have to get the different consultants' reports together. Yeah. No, just, just append them. Uh, again, just getting the reports monthly is achieving the reporting. Okay, okay, now, that's fine. It, it, it's, it's not saying that you, you have to make something pretty to present to anyone. It's just making them do their work. Oh, if, it, if it's passing on the reports, then that, yes, that's not an issue. Absolutely. And then digesting the, you know, the summary or the, the, maybe the executive summary that they usually put at the top of the reports so that if you do present, you, you just consolidate the four or five executive summaries. Yeah. Bonds are down, stocks are up. This is good. This is bad. Um, and, and so I think you're there very easily. Yeah, no, they don't give us summaries. They actually only do um, semi-annual presentations. So I, I will get my statement of earnings. I'll get the list of all with the securities, um, but I don't get the uh, market statements and economic conditions except for semi-annually. Then that's what you get. Okay. All right, anything else on this section? So Heidi, would, do you want to soften that so that it's um, um, a statement like best practices are and we will strive to achieve? If, if that's the concern that you may not have that input to provide um, the, the deliverables for item C. Uh, I, I'd I mean, rather I... not say we'll strive to achieve you know, if, we're, we, if best practice or something. I think it, I'm comfortable saying on a regular basis on a minimum annually. And then if we can do it more often, we do it more often. But just that's why I, I kind of want to just say annual, have that be the only formal requirement. And then I can keep adding more. And then this document can be updated as we, we develop this. I mean, it can be changed in the next year if we find out it's quarterly or monthly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, annually then, feels adequate to me. You'd be getting right. an email from document, me every month. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I don't again, want I don't want an email every month. <laughs> but that that's that's okay because what that tells Standard and Poor's is someone is watching this monthly. Someone is doing something right. monthly you, versus oh yeah, it's on my calendar. I got to do it once a year. That that's that's again it. It's practice and optics, so.
So I'm going to get a reputation here, but in uh, C in the second line, I think you want a comma after select board. Ah, uh, yes. All that time grading uh, student papers and stuff. I just, I can't, <laughs> I can't stop myself. No, it's good. We need a professor here. <laughs> All right. Now, C is a big one here, which um, that I'll, I'll say is a lightning rod. Um, now, Deb, if you're on, um, can we certify free cash 120 days after the close of the uh, prior uh year? I, you know, I've never, I've never done it before. I do know that November first was always a target date, but uh, to have it actually done might be a push, especially since this will be my first time doing it, and it's, you know, in a transition year. But if we strive to that, you know, that's right, right, that's right. acceptable. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to call that out because the idea in the past was that we wait as long as we can so no one knows <laughs> which yes but that's kind of you know maybe not best practices but once we know free cash planning for that component begins so i, I just i mentioned that no, it and, and Peter, that C is taken directly from the 2012 policy that was approved. So that actually is already our current policy. Oh. Almost word for word. <laughs> Super. Then it was a cut and paste, but it, we, we haven't um, <laughs> no, I can't. executed no. by performance. So We definitely did not. Well, we should strive. <laughs> yeah, we'll strive. We will strive. If I can jump in, I feel like I thought that the problems we have had in the past with certifications always seem to have come from the state uh, and not from us getting our documents into the state on time, but rather the state getting back to us or having questions about the documents we had. So I guess stri strive is a good word, but certainly we can't control it if history is any um, guide. I thought also there was some thinking that we needed to wait until we had audited financial, you know, until the auditors were done before we, before we um, did this. And I, Deb, you might want to comment on that, but I, I, I also thought that it wasn't necessary to wait for that. I don't believe it's necessary. I do believe that there was some concern that the auditors could make changes and then free cash could change if they made changes. So I believe that that's why they waited. But if we feel like we have, you know, that the auditors aren't gonna make a whole lot of changes or anything, it's definitely doable. I mean, like this year, the auditors are coming in November. And so we would have, you know, something done by mid-December. Um, I know, like years and years ago, they used to come in October. So it could have been all coinciding at the same time of the November 1st deadline, but. Right, and Deb, I, I think it's very prescriptive. Um, it's top line. Um, no, 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 it would have to be free cash. So it would have to be equity. So never mind. Um, well, I'm okay with keeping this as it is, especially as this was already the pre-existing policy and it says that we will strive to. Can, can I, can we just go back to the introductory paragraph to this section? Um, manage and invest the town's operating cash to, I might suggest that we just say to provide for necessary liquidity and avoid imprudent risk and leave it at that. Um, and it eliminate all the other things in the list, you mean? Well, to, to ensure, I mean, ensure is always, yes, we wanna do that, but 
um, it's a strong word, but but ensure legality. I'm not sure what that means. Safety, that's I guess that would be okay. But optimize yield, I, I don't think is what we are trying to do with the cash account. Mm. So I think that's just inaccurate. Again, it goes back to the C of the investment policy is that within the strict confines of what we can invest, you want to optimize yield. So it may be between 0.05, uh, five basis points or 10 basis points with the same level of risk and you go for the 10 versus the five. On, on the scale of things, it may amount to $10 a year, but you're optimizing within the lanes you can. So I, I think we get to the same place, even however you word it. Yes, and actually, Peter, I think it is good to keep the legality in there because the legal list is, limits and changes every year on where you're allowed to invest trust funds. So we are bound to follow that. So maybe we could say manage and invest the town's operating cash um, in a manner consistent with all applicable laws and regulations. That, that's that's yes, fine. That, that yep. gets us to the same place. Um, but would, Jane, would you want to keep the rest of this also or to replace we could is I mean, that just to replace the legal yeah okay. i was just i was just responding to heidi's comment about keeping the concept of legality in there okay uh sorry can you restate what you said there uh i don't manage and invest the town's operating cash in a manner consistent with all applicable laws and regulations What's what's this? What's the safety? What's well, then, the we, safety could, then we could just say and provide for necessary liquidity and avoid imprudent risk. And and I don't know if you want to mention optimized yield. I think we should at least say something about you know within the um, you know con consistent with the risk profile or something like that because because we're really not trying to just optimize yield. No, but the the, the law actually refers to following for safety, liquidity, and yield, those are the principles to follow. So if you're following the laws, you are actually automatically following those principles. Oh, okay. So the law already talks about yield. Right. So we could basically, so then we could eliminate this? You could eliminate it unless you or wanted to emphasize that you know that that's what you're following. I see. Um, I'd leave it in because, again, this is kind of a training, an orientation document for the next generation of, of uh, you know, uh, town fathers, mothers, mothers and fathers, people. Yeah. Okay. I think you can leave it as written. Okay. Whatever.
All right, anything else in the cash reserves and liquidity section here? Steve, I kind of question F, the last sentence, the operating budget will not be subsidized by the stabilization fund because we kind of did that this last year um, due to an emergency that we were short. Um, and then we did replenish the stabilization fund. Um, I don't know if it's, can you say the town will strive not to use the operating budget or something, but to say it will not is pretty absolute. And that raises a great point is that these are guidelines and it was during a pandemic, right? Because of the uh, change in um, regulations. Um, but yeah, how, however you make that um, uh, from a definitive will not to will. But to your point, I was thinking the same thing, guys, um, you, if you make any sort of exception in writing here, you're gonna you're gonna get pinged on it or questioned on it or open yourself up. Whereas if you leave the statement as is, it is we only act otherwise in an extreme situation. I would strike it. It doesn't add anything. Just strike it. I, I kind of think too. The whole thing. I would take that line out. Yeah. The whole sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that covers the purpose of the stabilization fund, right? So okay. Uh sorry, are we done with uh this section? Moving on to accounting, auditing, and financial reporting. There's something funky about the second sentence of B. Um, should it say either the either the principal's responsible or town administrator and finance director, but but saying both doesn't seem to read quite right. Well, it should, in an audit, it should be all, all um, individuals are partaking in the audit um, and financial coordinate so they conduct. So it, it's it's because um, an audit, the CEO and CFO have to sign off on the audits to Sarbanes Oxley, knowing that the numbers presented are your numbers. Here, we're including the three principles. And I, as when I reviewed this, that made sense that it's all parties, um, town administrative finance director. Um, My comment, Peter, isn't a, really a substantive one. It's just I think it. I think there's something funky about the way it's written. Should it should it read the principals responsible for the conduct of the annual audit will present it in person? So, are the town administrator and finance director, in addition to the principals responsible? Or they are the principals responsible. I believe they are the principals responsible. I think it it's thrown off by that parentheses around the S. If you just say the principals responsible, comma the town administrator and finance director for the conduct of the well, I don't know. Right, because you guys are the administrators, right, and you're responsible for that aspect, and it's audited, and then the select board signs off on that, that like the board of directors that the principal
principles, the CEO, CFO presented accurate material representative statements. I just feel like one of those two, I think it's to read right, I think it should either say the principals are responsible for the conduct or the town administrator and finance director will present. <coughs> but didn't we just say that the principals responsible are the town administrator and the finance director? Right, it, it, it's just, I'm only making a grammatical point. I, I just don't think this sentence makes sense the way it's written. How about this? It goes from the general to the specific. And if the, the yes, either way is right. If you want to just stick with the finance director and town administrator, that's um, will get us to the same place. So does this parse better, Jane? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Stephen, uh, item B, at the very end, I think you want an S for long-term bonds at the very, very end of item B. Thank you. Um, sorry, on D and going back to D in item six, should that say GASB standards instead of statements? I think, so. I, 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 I think um, again, the um, gaps, accrual accounting, cash accounting statements are different. Um, GAP, GASB, the output are the statements, but standards get you to the same place. It's just the interim step. You follow those standards to get to the statements. So. So would standards be a better word here? Yes. Question for Heidi on 7D, um, is that of any concern? I mean, do we ever, have we ever come close to exceeding that? We, we, we have not yet. Um, and I, I think it's some, it should be a target. It's something we should talk about. And when we're looking at capital expenses, um, that should be a goal not to exceed the 10%. Do you know where we are at right now? Uh, I want to say around 7%. Roughly, I'd have to go and look. I'm not sure off the top of my head. We've been under 10. And Heidi, real quick, um, about point E, 
and I'll strive to avoid the issuance of revenue anticipation notes. Have we done those in the recent past? We did one we did before we year, went, right? yep, yeah, last year, before we went to quarterly. Okay, that's um, right. So we can't say that we'll never do one, but I think it's good to say strive to avoid. But was that the first one since you've been treasurer? It's the one first one since I was treasurer, but I believe there had been, when I looked it back in the history, it had happened before. Yeah. That, that service of 2 million over 30 million is about 7%. So yeah, Heidi, you're right. And, and again, um, that's a conservative number. I would never like to reach that. Uh, the only thing published was um, the Massachusetts University system that has a, a policy of 8%. That service cannot exceed 8% of the operating budget for any university system. So if we reach 8%, uh, 10%, that's risky. I'm just wondering if we need to have some striving language in there rather than just saying should not exceed because. No, I, I like the should, should not exceed. Well, I, I do too, but we don't want to be in violation of our policies. I think that was one of the points right. you were making earlier, Peter. You well, know, then, Jane, then we modify yeah. the policies. I, I, I would sure. counter that then in, in you know, uh, uh, those times that we have to exceed it because of the building boom or whatever, uh, we can come back and modify this living document. The, the more guidance we provide, uh, especially on expense, I, I think the more favorable it will be viewed from the agency. And again, um, uh, it will be shut down at town meeting anyway, so. But, but the problem is, if we say 10% and then we decide, okay, we're gonna do 15% for whatever reason, there's an emergency or whatever, no one's gonna to remember to go back to the policy and amend the policy to 15%. So we, it, the more prescript, prescriptive we are, the more likely we are to trip ourselves up. So if we keep it high level, um, we don't run into that problem. Well, is the word should enough to give that leeway? Cause we're not saying will not exceed, we're saying should not exceed. It, if I were an auditor, I'd say, well, you said it should be 10% and it's 15. What's the deal? Well, then you explain it. You explain it in the exit interview or during the, the interview on that subject. Why did you, what was the should and what was the driver? If it was, we just wanted to spend money, well, then they'll ding us. If we said, well, we had to because the Pine Hill Elementary School, which is blah, 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 was falling down. Yeah, my view is if we don't, if it's not in there, we don't have to explain it away. So if we say yeah. we'll strive not to exceed 10%. Yeah, I, I'm still hesitant about putting a number. In there. I, 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 I want to have people explain why they're spending taxpayers money yeah. beyond guidelines, beyond prudent guidelines, because uh, again, then it's, 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 it's the laissez-faire it's the way it is now just let's spend money yeah i think the 10 percent actually is a good number to keep in there because it does seem to be we the last several years have not been there you know close to 10 percent. but i think it's something to keep in mind how about the town will strive to ensure that appropriations for long-term debt service shall not exceed 10 percent And again, this is groundbreaking. There is, and I, Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think this was in the original. Let me guidelines. check it. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back and look right now. Um, and and I purposely put in there to make people aware that this this debt number, because it kind of comes in late in the the year when we do budgeting, uh, or historically has. Uh, it's 1.2, 1.3, 1, 
it's known these long-term burn uh, bonds we know what it is it's the short-term bonds uh that may vary um but we can lock that down as soon as we can and know if we're tripping it or not and then we have to be fiscally prudent because that's the long-term assets that we're financing which it goes into the long-term planning, which goes into the forecasting, which goes into best practices. Yeah, and actually, Peter, it is in the one that was the 2012. There were two- At 10%? Two, yeah. Two At 10%? Items, yes. Two items for debt policy. Number one was appropriations for long-term debt service except self-supporting debt should not exceed 10% of the total general fund and overlay expenditures. And then number two is the town will strive to avoid the issuance of revenue anticipation notes. God bless them. <laughs> they had foresight. So do we know, I know this is a guess, Heidi, but um, are we at risk of immediately violating this when the library opens? No. Okay. Because we, I, I presume that there is going to be some version of a large bill to pay upon completion of the library. Right, but we're talking debt service, not per amount of debt. So debt services, you know, if if, if they're four million over, we're gotcha. paying it over twenty years. Sure. Right, gotcha. and Steve, you bring up a good point because that, and again, my my suggestion would be we look at that debt retirement, because some debt's falling off, we've paid it off, we paid the fire station off. And so that expense is retiring, yet we're adding all of the shiny new vehicles that everyone wants. And it's the net of that going forward that contributes. That's why it's so hard to understand what that number is. And the placed bonds are, are fixed. So we, we know that the short term stuff varies, but at low costs. And, and I think we can push out the principal for three or three years. But that that's difficult to comprehend from, you know, uh, salaries, wages and benefits, buying uh, tools, buying hoses, because that's a uh, one and done. It's this debt service that is a, a fluid net amount uh, or net expense going forward based upon as you retire old debt and replace it with new debt. And so uh, I'd encourage us to look at that more closely um, throughout the budgeting season because it, it's a big piece. And again, we, we are now setting a target or reestablishing a target, not setting a target, but reestablishing a target of the total operating budget. Okay, I think after that discussion, I'm I'm okay with the way that 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 seven uh, D is written. But how do you how do you guys feel, especially Jane and Brendan? I'm okay with it that way, Brendan. How do you how do you feel? I don't love it, but uh, I'm ready to move on. Right. Um, so this is the end of the document here. Um, so any any last comments or changes before we bring this document to a vote? Steve, Steve I have one question. Yeah. If, if the select board makes a bunch of changes on this, do you want to have the option to go back to you? Do yes. You guys? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think your, if... I would make your vote approval contingent upon select board approval or something. Then your vote rather to. That's politically interesting. 
because they did have the guidelines voted on and approved that we never knew about until IDU presented them. And now if they change these and vote on those, does it come back and it's a ball? So we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, that's what I would feel. I don't, I don't know how does the rest of the advisory feel, but I feel like a financial policies document, whatever is the actual final version, uh, I think that the actual final version needs to be approved by both us and the select board. But that's that's how I would feel about it, as, as painful as it would be to go through this again. But I don't... <laughs> Now, I, I'd prefer not to make our approval contingent on the select board because I think our approval is our approval. And right. if they want to approve something different, then then we haven't necessarily approved that and, and it'll come back to us. Right. All I'm saying is that I we approve this version that that I'm that I just saved. <laughs> and if they change it, then it's no longer this version. So then we're gonna have to look at it again. Yeah. All right. To, to be clear, why would we have to look at it again? We approved something, they changed something. Yeah, if they if they changed if they changed something in the policy, I mean, I guess uh, there is the point that we are advisory and we are not in any way executive or regulatory. So our our opinion actually doesn't matter anyways. Um, Correct. So. We're, we're advising them. They can vote on something <laughs> yeah. else. They can vote yeah. to you know accept banana peels if they want. Yeah, I mean that's that is also a good point. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? If I may or, continue on here, I feel like I don't want to give the select board the power to give us more work to do. <laughs> well, I would just go back to Heidi, though, because I, I thought, Heidi, that, that there was benefit to you of being able to say that these policies have been approved by the advisory committee. And if that's not true, then, you know, does that weaken your argument? It helps with the select board. I think it would help with standard and poor if we do not reach the point where there is a policy that the select board has voted on. I it would be helped us I, be able I, to say I, something to I, them to Heidi, say. Heidi, I'd, I'd um, restate that, that we have complementary, supplementary, one of those Venn diagram policies, because they voted on something way back last decade. Right. We're voting on something this decade, which kind of uh, enhances what they voted on. So if I was saying it in course, we have two bodies, one elected, one appointed, that are going down the same path with the same guidance that get us to the same point of fiscal prudence and um, oversight. So regardless of what they do, we're, we're both doing our jobs, whether we agree or not on the finer points and um headings and whatnot right it's just whatever they vote is going to be the policy right i think peter the point is that they want to know that the town capital letter capital t has a policy and i think i don't think that the advisory committee sets the capital t town's policy the select board does so all that really matters is that so the select board votes on something um so I guess to put a different spin on it, Heidi, does it matter to Standard and Poor's whether a document is approved by only the select board versus approved by both the select board and the advisory committee? Or, or... No, I, I, I think because at the end of the day, the only document they'll consider accepted policy is something signed off by the select board. I, right. I, think, I think the fact that we have an advisory board that drives it and is the one that's gonna be responsible for following a lot of it is key. Um, right. And, and the fact that you guys didn't even know there was one from the 2012, you know, that is- So is, why did we have yeah. to do this one if there was one already approved? Because it's if out of date. And I wanted to get input from what your side of the people who work with the budget and who are looking at it, what you're comfortable with seeing it because I think we have a chance to craft the policy here for select board. Ultimately, the select boards. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jane. Well, I was just going to say, it sounds like at a minimum, it would be a good idea if there could be advisory representation at the select board meeting where they consider this so we can explain why we felt the way we felt about it. Yeah, I mean, for sure, I would, I would, uh, it, I would attend that meeting and I would probably ask one of the 
one of the people who who, who drove this uh, document to also be there if possible. But you know, I think certainly between Heidi and me, we could um, we could back up the uh, the discussion of 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 our approving this document. So. Right, and what, I'm going to have, have this. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my, my only comment was, what do we have, a 66% um, uh, portion of uh, the select board that have been on advisory at this point, right? Yes. It used to be 80%. Now we're down to 66%. So um, it's, well, it's a, three a majority five, will so know. 60%. Right. um all right well what i would propose is we approve this we we uh give it to the select board if they change it we can we can cross that bridge if and when it happens um again if they change it and then approve it it's, it's not like our objection is really going to matter that much so um i don't i don't think that what we do should they change it matters to us voting on it right now so i would propose that no. we vote on this document Sound good? All right. Yes. Can I get a motion to approve this document, the Town of Sherburne Financial Policies Overview, as uh, edited uh, on screen during this meeting? Um, uh, can I get a motion to approve? Second. Wait, I need the actual motion first. Uh, I'll make that oh. motion. So, so moved to, to approve this, okay. this document. Okay. Now I need a second. Now I second. All right. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Dan Sickle. Aye. Brenda Daly. Aye. Jane Matarazzo. Aye. Stephen Leahy. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Mark Albers. Aye. All right. The motion passes uh, 8 0. Saved. And a huge thank you to Peter and Mark for all the work they did. And Jane. Oh, but, but there's a second document. And Jane. <laughs> I'm assuming that we want to also do this uh, reserves policy. Right. Because do we, we, our intention is for this to also be part of the official town policy. Is that true? Or is this just a supplementary document. This this would be a standalone document in my book. I mean, the financial policy is like the umbrella, and then I would see that we'd have a reserve policy. There'll be an investment policy. We're going to have a separate OPEB one. That's a different issue. Okay. But how is there a similar benefit to having this one voted? Voted on now in in the process. Yes, I I, I was worried you're going to say that. <laughs> I, I, I know, but but I'm, I mean it's a long night. If people want to put this off, I'm happy to to say we're working on it, and and we can send them the draft if we have the draft here. Well, maybe um, when, we, when is our first have... meeting? I mean, Steve, will we be meeting in September such that we could do this at our first, you know, September meeting and still get it in? Yeah, I mean, we'll certainly, uh, you know, essentially, depending on how much leftover business there was from, from tonight, I, my plan was either our next meeting was going to be in two weeks or in four weeks. Um, um, you know, so if we don't do this tonight, because we do have a lot to do tonight, um, we could meet again in two weeks and have a shorter meeting. Um, or we can try to cram it all in now. Or I guess, Heidi, if you're like, um, it's not critical to have this document fully uh, executed and approved by the select board prior to your call with S&P, then, then I guess we can push this one off. But, but I don't know what, how does everybody, I, I, yeah, I guess number one, Heidi, how do you feel about whether this thing is fully voted? And then two, um, assuming you're like, yes, I would like this to be voted and approved, then how does everyone on advisory feel about discussing it now versus pushing this off and having a meeting in two, two weeks? 
I, I would say let's push this off until your next meeting, not do it in four weeks. If I can tell Standard and Poor due to COVID, we couldn't get all the meetings in. We have a draft that's done. I think that should be something that can help in our story. I can submit the draft for them to look at and we can just let them know we're working on it because I don't think, I know the select board's gonna be looking at the OPEB trust, the housing trust, and now this other financial guidelines. I don't yeah. realistically think in the next two meetings, we're gonna get through all the documents with them. Okay. Now, Heidi, and were we dinged? Were we dinged on the audit for a reserve policy? I, I don't recall. Oh, no. That was my next question. <laughs> no, they're not. They, they, they're, they're all under investment policies with them. So they've asked. So some towns have a debt management. They have a reserve policy. They have an investment policy. Then they have the OPEP trust policy, and they have a financial management guideline. So depending on the towns. They ask, you know, what types of policies do you have that are approved? Um, the only reason I thought the reserve one, it seemed to be, it, it directly talked about what we use our stabilization fund, funds for. Um, and it was a little more detail and it was more specific for free cash and stabilization funds. And it's pretty short and, I, and then, the, you know, one and a half pages is the example of a calculation and some of the things that you do use it for. Um, but so I it's think not that addressing it's a have. specific audit point, like the management oversight and the fiscal policies were one that stood out that when right. we all reviewed it, it said, we got to have this. And then right. lo and behold, we did have it because the select board voted on it and we just enhanced it. Okay. This is a, a, a nice to have. And, you know, when you come to stabilization funds, it's, it's again, I, I apologize. I didn't have a chance to memorize or at least review intensively what was sent. Um, but it, it, th that is more broad based because stabilization by nature is you know, unplanned and, and to use to address things that can't be contemplated. Uh, right, but they, they wanted to know what percentage we put into stabilization funds and then how we're using it. And also, you know, this, this reserve fund talks about our use of free cash and, and it makes it a little more detailed and explicit than the overall umbrella policy that you just voted. Um, all right, well, what I'm hearing is that um, we can push this off. Um, and I think if we push it off four weeks, this could this would still theoretically give you enough time to bring this to the select board on September 23rd. Um, so I think yes. I think I'm going to I'm going to shut this one down for now. And, yes. and I, I would offer just for expediency, if anyone has comments or thoughts about this reserve policy, just send me, just send me your edits. I'll try to combine all of them so we can all look at a document that's a little, that already reflects our thoughts and it might make it a little quicker when we go through it next time. Sounds good. Absolutely. Um, all right. All right, so I'm sneaking in um, a discussion of the um, ARPA um, funds here because it's still sort of financial policy. Um, uh, so as most of you probably know, the town I believe is slated to get, was it, was it 1.2, 1.4 million um, in ARPA funds? Um, but there are various parameters for um, uh, what this fund, these funds are supposed to be used for. And uh, the select board, I believe, um, I think, uh, I think we're doing a, a system that's similar to the um, reserve fund transfers where when people have requests um, for ARPA funds for a particular project, then they go to the select board for an approval and then they will come to um, advisory also for an approval. Um, one of the questions was um, for 
smaller requests. Currently, they had it. I mean, just they picked a number out of a hat. I believe they suggested fifty thousand dollars. So, for any requests that were less than fifty thousand um, uh, dollars, they were wondering whether it would be okay to only have select board approval and not have to come through the advisory committee. And then for any projects that are larger than that, um, that they would require approval from both from both uh, uh, boards. Um, so I wanted to see what people thought of that. Now, again, it's uh, there are particular um, uh, uses for the funds, um, and I believe uh, that you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, that the the usage of the funds will at some point also get audited after the fact, right? So that, um, that's correct. Yeah, so there, you know, uh, so somebody will be will be looking to make sure that we didn't, you know, just approve a, a fleet of Teslas for the police department using using this money. Um, so so there's already one layer of uh, screening, which is the select board, and then a, a second layer of, you know, uh, post facto uh, screening as an audit. And then the question is, do we want to also add another layer of oversight by making everybody come to us? Or are we okay with a threshold below which you do not need to come to advisory? And if so, what threshold? Um, so Steve, can, I, can I just add, there's actually another, another layer there. I'm working with a consultant who is helping us with these ARPA funds. And so before it even goes to the selectman, she reviews any of the requests to make sure that it is applicable and that falls into the categories. And then when, when we're filling out the form that we're using the right words to make it, you know, absolutely applicable and everything else like that. So that's that's there before it even goes to the select board. Great. Great. And here's, I believe, I'm gonna put this on screen and maybe you can tell me if this is not the right thing, but this um, I believe has these are the those are the categories. Yes. These are the approved categories, right? Correct. So essentially, the usage has to kind of fit into, into this list. And I can send this around to everybody if I haven't already. I don't actually remember if I did or not. Um, so me personally, on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, if somebody wants money, they, they have to come through advisory. That's part of, yeah, I'm kind of like, that's part of our job. But then I'm also like, I do not want to have a nine person committee discuss the disbursement of $1.4 million, you know, $50,000 at a time, $20,000 at a time. I, I just, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so so I, so I, I open it up to the floor um, as to how others on advisory want to handle this. My only concern, Steve, is that, and it appears if I'm reading these correctly, are one-time projects. What we don't want to do is pad the operating budgets with ephemeral dollars due to a yeah. pandemic. No, and in fact, then it's, we it's have not to, allowed. Okay, then we have to carry that. If it's a, a one and done, and it's very prescriptive from what it sounds like. And I, I, I remember from the payroll protection, you have to, when you ask forgiveness, you have to sh clearly state that you followed certain parameters, um, that that threshold is appropriate. And as long as it doesn't have the operating budget that we have to make up for in the next year, usually salaries, wages, and benefits. So if we hire someone um, or if we start a project that has legs over multiple years, then it comes back to the taxpayers to support that in out years. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think all of these, gen generally speaking, are projects for things that were identifiably due directly to COVID. Steve, I, I would tend to agree with you, but for the infrastructure piece of this, I, I think that, you know, the infrastructure clearly doesn't have to be tied specifically to COVID. And 
And I, and that's the only thing, I mean, I totally agree with you that, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's painful. I, I don't have any great desire to go through each one of these either, but I do think that, um, especially with respect to infrastructure, you know, these are basically potentially capital expenditures and for them to get no review other than by the select board, if they're under $50,000, just doesn't quite seem right to me. I mean, it's a, it, it would be a way to circumvent the, the procedures that we have in place for all other types of capital expenditures. I mean, in, in all other cases, you would need advisory and capital budget and the select board to, to all agree. And in this case, that you know, that wouldn't be true if, if something was under $50,000. Well, what if we and set the threshold? Question, well, this is a question to Deb um, on that, that capital versus operation. Uh, are there any um, definitions, Deb, around um, uh, the, the capitalization of these? Or if we wanted to do a water, clean water, uh, and I'm just uh, drinking water treatment, and it costs a million dollars. Do we submit a million dollars, and they give us a million dollars? Therefore, we don't have to capitalize it. It's all paid out of that fund. Um, how, how? What's the the mechanics of the reimbursement? Well, the, it's not a, actually a true reimbursement. They're giving us the money in advance, and then you okay. just have to justify what you spend it on. And as far as capital uh, spending, I really haven't heard anything about that, to be quite honest. I'd have to look into that to see how, how that you know, plays out. But they've, we've already received uh, $226,000 of it. We expect to receive another about $400,000 in the next two weeks or something. And then a year from and now, then, we'll get the other 600,000. And then another billion after reconciliation from Congress. <laughs> I think Sherburn slated for a billion because <laughs> we need it. Okay, and so I, it'd be it'd be nice to know the specifics because it addresses the capital piece. That mm -hmm. if you know, it, it gives us all guidelines that if everything coming to us has to be paid and then moved on. Yeah. What what if we set the threshold at the town's capital threshold, which is fifteen thousand dollars, right? No, it's ten thousand. Oh gosh, is it really that low? Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. Can we change that? <laughs> yeah, I think you can. Um, ten thousand. Okay. Well, uh, what if we set it at ten thousand? So essentially, anybody who wants a project for, paid for that if the town were otherwise paying for it, it would have to go through capital budget. <clears throat> Essentially, that's the size of a thing that would have to come through us. Well, I was gonna say most, most of the, the money that they're looking to spend isn't really on capital so much, but the, a lot of the things like that we're thinking about is more as um, lost revenue, like uh, let's say the ambulance lost revenue of about $20,000 last year, that, that money could go back to the ambulance fund. And same thing with recreation. Um, it's, so they're not truly capital mm -hmm. items, but you know, they're looking yeah. at 20,000, 30,000 here and there. To me, that's all the more reason why we should opine on all of these because they're basically deciding whose budgets get a little extra. And that's you know, right in our wheelhouse. I mean, that's what we exist to do, is, yeah, is so, to so on that kind of thing. Somebody's got to do it. And if we just let the select board do it, you know, aren't we abdicating our job? Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I, I hate to say it, but I think that's our job. I, I, think that's what we're, <laughs> I think that's what advisory's primary purpose is. And I don't think we... I, but I don't I, want to. You know. okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, I have no argument against that. <laughs> other than I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think I think that that's what David was thinking when he proposed the $50,000 is that, you know, it's already gone through a couple levels and then the money can't, we can't allocate that money until after you meet. So we've already gone from the select board only meets, you know, every other week for them to do it. Then once they have that 
then it has to get on your agenda and that could be another two or three weeks out and then it will be you know it's just the mm. the process i think do you know deb is there any reason why the order has to go select board first and then us could it be that when somebody comes in with a request then you know whoever has the next meeting whether it's advisory select board then we get to vote on it first uh, it doesn't it you know that th this is all kind of a learn as we go kind of thing yeah. David uh, was hoping to set this up like a reserve fund transfer process, basically, that, you yeah. know, and that's the way the reserve fund transfers work. And yeah. we do vote on those first and we vote on all of them. Yeah. Do we do we always do we always vote on actually the reserve fund transfers? Do we always vote on the second or first or does it not matter? I, I actually have never gone through that process before, but I thought that it was the select board uh, went voted on it first and then it went to you, but I could be wrong there. Do we do something like whoever has the next meeting, make it a joint meeting and do this at the beginning of the meeting or something like that? Uh, that's- Oh God, that's no, we don't tough. want to do that. No, I don't, I don't want to be trying to organize joint meetings with a select board. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I personally, uh, whatever whatever rule it is that we come up with it's our own internal rule right so we can make the rule whatever we want so i don't see why we couldn't just have it be that anytime somebody has a arpa fund request whatever whenever it comes in whoever has the next meeting they get it first and then and then the other the other committee gets it after that right yeah we could do that. I mean, I, I guess it's just a matter of uh, whoever is presenting. Let's say, for instance, what's on the select board um, agenda for tomorrow is the Council on Aging. Uh, they're proposing to ask for $30,000 to be used for uh, a feasibility study. And it. Um, so I think that they, she was lining up a presenter to explain the whole process and everything else like that to the select board. So then it becomes like okay so they do it that do they then have to have the the presenter come to the advisory as well did, did i miss last town meeting where that was shot down the voice well, of the voters <laughs> said thank you <laughs> well, i mean yeah. that would you know let's I, not I don't, talk I'm, about that I'm right just, now we're yeah, not I'm talking just, about that right now exactly yeah so uh, it's, it's, a, point, it's, a, it's a, i mean peter's Peter's got a really good point. I have to say, I mean, this is exactly the reason why we need to vote on this stuff because yeah, you know, they they just want to decide to do something different yeah. than what has no, already been true. decided. No, it's a gold it's, rush. It, everyone's going to be coming and saying this is fits into this uh, two point seven. Therefore, I should have it, and without at least the um, diversity of uh, the group of nine of us looking at it from different angles, you know, to, it enhances the board's decision and, and makes the process uh, stronger. So um, I, I like the low threshold. Can I ask, ask, sorry, can I ask a quick question? So these funds, even if they are used for a capital expenditure, do not need to be voted upon by the town to do so? No. Correct. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's, I mean, that's, there's the rub, right? And I mean, that's, uh, that's why, that's the argument for why even $5,000 really should come before us. Um, because in every other instance where the town is trying to spend money, whether it's their operational budget or its capital budget, they come through us first. Um, and this happens to be a an external source of money, but it is still money that once it is turned over to the town, it belongs to the town and how the town spends it is, I mean, it's uh, it has not been determined yet. And for, for every other way that the town spends money advisory, is one of the layers um, of oversight that, that you have to go through. And uh, so if I could so opine, I, if I could opine, it should be sunk costs, costs that we've already incurred. So it has no impact on the go forward budget or it is um, 
lost revenue, the top line. So, and, and that's, that's, that's tricky because what's lost revenue? I'm thinking of Farm Pond where they didn't have all of the out of town stickers for that year. Absolutely. Um, that would be uh, parameters, but something that maintains levels of service historically and not adding to the operational budget or to the capital stock. Again, and that's just my simple way of thinking. And if we opine, then we we will have the opportunity to ensure that that those you know principles are followed, Peter. Yeah. But if we don't yeah. opine, we we can't. We we have no input. Yeah, no, I think what I'm hearing is that time. there is not a reasonable argument for why all of these things should not come before advisory. Does anybody have an argument for why these things should not come before us? I, what I would say to that, Steve, and, and I'm not even sure I would necessarily vote this way, but um, we have some pretty strict guidelines. The money have, we have a town director of finance. Um, and so there's a certain amount that in theory uh, to me could be given that responsibility could that responsibility could be given to those people knowing that there are hard guidelines already in place and that we're staring at. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's where I would suggest maybe having the same threshold as the town's cutoff for capital, which is 10,000. That I can get on board with. That sounds uh, reasonable. Jane, how does that sound to you? I, I think, it, I'm sorry, I think we should vote on all of these. Because uh, I don't really think, I mean, capital was the most obvious thing that jumped to mind. But if, if the decisions are going to be, you know, who gets to get reimbursed for some extra expenses here and there, that's essentially a decision to increase somebody's budget. For next year, and I, I, I think that's in our wheelhouse, and we should vote on that. You know, and again, again, there's, there's no, uh, you know, no hard and fast rules. If you want to try, you know, if you want to start by approving everything, and then it turns into, oh my gosh, this is more than we bargained for, then you can change your mind. You know, there's no, every, every community is doing it differently, and that this was just our initial thought process on the procedure. So we, you know, we can absolutely do it by, you know, having you vote on everything and then, you know, change as we yeah. go. The money, the money has to be spent by 2024. So this could be an ongoing process. All right. I, I like that. I like that compromise, Deb, is how about we will, we will vote on every request to start. And if we discover that we are just getting slammed with uh, dozens of ticky tack things for Three thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and it's a waste of our time. Then, um, then we can we can adjust it. Okay. Um, all right. And do you do you want it to Any... go through the select? Do you want it to go through the select board first, or whenever they come first, whoever has the meeting scheduled first? I would say in the in the interest of expedience, I would say whoever has the meeting first would see it first because to me it doesn't really matter whether the select board said yes or no to it um i mean other than if the select board says no then we don't have to bother with it i guess <laughs> but but uh to me i think our job as advisory is that we look at it without uh the input of the you know elected um executive body we're we're independent from them so um, so well, it Steve, really I would say they, they could reject it and we could accept it too because they, of, yes. again, the long-term implications, which they may not have sight on. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would say, I, I think that if the select board rejects it, then it would never come to us, you know? Right. It, it definitely wouldn't go to you if, if they, right. And then ultimately if we if it's if it always has to be select board force first and then us second, the overall process will become less efficient. It's just going to take longer on average to get all of these things approved. So, so I would rather go through the process that that gets them through quicker. Um, all right. So. I don't like 
now we have our oops, don't end meeting. So we have our first uh, sheet. Sorry, I'm just looking for that first. Uh, here it is. Okay. All right, so this is the first uh, request that we have. Um, and this is for that um, Woodhaven Leland water system that um, we approved at town meeting last year um, in the amount of 198,000. Uh, and it was contingent on the relevant parties coming up with a um, financial agreement for how to service the debt on it. Um, but now this is the first request is essentially to pay for the full project out of the ARPA funds. Um, so hopefully everybody remembers this project from the town meeting last year. Um, and I believe that the argument here is that this satisfies a number of um, the accepted categories, one being water supply, drinking water, and then also support for affordable housing, um, as both Woodhaven and Leland are essentially, for, for many years, we're the only uh, um, uh, affordable housing in town, uh, both projects being actually um, initiated by the town uh, many, many years ago. Um, so Steve, I, I wrote up this um, for, for the uh, report. And so it resonates strongly with me that this is the best of both worlds is that the town voted on it. It's a good uh, investment for the town itself because it's town owned property. It benefits the um, individual renters, tenants. Um, and so it's all positive, positive, positive. And the cherry on top is that the taxpayers don't have to foot the bill, nor the renters. Oh, how sure are we? This is all just going to slide through and we're going to get reimbursed for all this. I think we already have this amount of money, right, Deb? We do. We yeah. yeah. So we already so, we already have this money, and we just have to set that money aside, like for this allocation. So when yeah. the expenses come through, we already have the the money. Yeah. So you have so the you only have, you have some money in a pot, and we have to allocate it. And these are one of the people who want it, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Do we have all the people on a list that want something? And do, is it greater than the allegation, allocation? No, uh, we we don't we don't really know. It will be. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so we're giving away this money piecemeal without knowing what the total requests are going to be, right? So it's kind of a first come first serve situation, right? Correct. All right. I, I I would also like to point out that we there is a clear legal requirement here that the people who are owners at Leland or who are long-term renters at Leland have the legal responsibility, economic responsibility for this. So the town, if we agree to this, the town is taking on a responsibility that is not legally its responsibility. It's legally the responsibility of another group. And I think that sets a bad precedent. And even though we have the money and even though the money can be used for this purpose, I don't think it's appropriate to use the money to cover expenses that are clearly someone else's responsibility. It's not the town's responsibility. I mean, we, you know, we, we looked at this last year, that's very clear. And I don't think to my knowledge, the select board has not made any attempt to try to work out an arrangement. I understand that we've been told people can't afford it, but you know, I don't think any attempt has been made to work out a, a, an equitable and fair arrangement that maybe people could afford over time, amortized over a certain period of time. I, I just don't think anyone's anyone has gone down that road. And I think that really the town owes the taxpayers at large, um, you know, the responsibility to, to do that before we just give away money. 
Well, I did, at town meeting, didn't they already vote to spend the money on this? Well, no, no, because what we we voted to do, well, that's a tricky question to answer. Conditionally, so, yes. yes. Conditionally, yes. yes. But but it was contingent on essentially Woodhaven, Leland, and quote unquote the town, i.e., the select board and the town administrator coming up with a financial arrangement for how they were going to pay for it. Um, and I don't, Deb, do you know, I thought that that there have actually been meetings between the trustees of Leland Woodhaven and um, David Williams plus or minus select board members about this. Is that, do you know if that is true or not? I, I really I really don't know. I know that Addie May and Sean did a lot of their research on to, you know, into this. And I believe that they were working with all the parties, but I'm I wasn't privy to any of the meetings or anything like that. So I'm not I'm not sure. Because I know uh, that I'll, I'll refresh everyone's memory is that the reserve fund that the um, tenants had to replace these expendable items. Um, is bank uh, is in deficit because of the poor water quality since the place was built, and and Jane, thank you very much for reminding me of that legal that legal piece because we searched for those leases, we found the leases, we digested them, and came up with the best um, uh, conditional um, uh, approval for the average taxpayer to agree with us. That taken into account, this is, again, a unprecedented pandemic relief or whatever the initials stand for, where we can rectify some basic poor geological dynamics that the town decided 20, 30 years, 40 years ago to build an affordable housing complex on uh, bedrock that didn't support non-acidic water. And the taxpayers uh, or the renters have been paying for the upgrades as much as they could, running into a deficit. And uh, again, being that, that uh, person of justice blindfold with the scale, weighing all of these legal aspects and requirements with what the town should do and, and having written up the um, uh, write up for the town meeting and then rewriting it after uh, consultation with, with uh, what actually went on at the um, advisory board meeting. It, it makes sense to me that this is a win, 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 win situation. Even looking at the black characters on the white page of the lease saying they have to pay for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll end my comment. And, and I think I, if I can channel Sean Colleen also, I know that if he were here, he would also point out the fact that, you know, a couple of years ago, the DEP had sent a letter to the town um, you know, essentially requiring that this issue be taken care of. And they only sort of, I don't know, lifted it or uh, um, whatever, suspended it because we promised we would take care of it. Um, now, now that said, I'm not disputing the fact that the lease says what it says, but I will tell you that the reason why we don't have more heat on us to get this done yesterday from the DEP is because we promised that we would get it done yesterday. Um, and I, I do, I do believe that they have had, um, meetings with the trustees of, um, Leland Farms and Woodhaven, um, and, um, I, I don't know the specifics, but I definitely, every time this gets brought up by the Leland Farm trustees, um, it is, it is made fairly clear that, that they do not feel that they can that they can afford to pay for this, um, and 
as much as we are not a political body, I think that the the potential that what we would that 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 our actions would result in essentially some people potentially losing their home or perhaps the entire Leyland Farm project going under um, is I, that's not that's not acceptable. You know when when we were discussing this at town meeting, my assumption was that the three parties would get together and discuss, okay, what is an amount that could be reasonably handled by the Leland um, residents? And then Woodhaven would take on the larger proportion of, um, of this project. Um, and if Woodhaven determined that they couldn't basically put the <laughs> most of the bill, that um, the town would eventually have to put some money into it in the form of an amount coming from the general fund into the elder housing revolving fund. And it would be a process year after year that would come through advisory. Um, but I was not under the impression that at no point would the town ever have to put any money into these projects. Um, I was just kind of like, yeah, you got to make a good concerted, concerted effort to to do the best you can, and then the town's going to cover the rest. Um, so instead, what we're saying is, oh, look at this money here. Why don't we just cover the whole thing now? So that's that's my perspective on this entire situation. I guess I guess one piece I'm trying to understand, which it sounds like we just don't really know at this point, is I'm reading the um, request for use of ARPA funds, right, that came through and it, it indicates right at town meeting in May, the situation was, yeah, they can spend the money and they'll work out a way to pay the town back. And then this right says, well, we couldn't figure out a way to do that. So the town, so, so this ARPA money should just pay for it. And I guess I'd be interested in knowing have they really made that effort or did they just stop because it was ARPA funds and that seemed like the easy way to just, okay, this is going to be a hard slog. It's going to be a difficult to reach agreement amongst all the parties. Here's the easy way out. Or did they really, ha have they really done the hard work to figure things out? And I don't know, maybe there's a solution where they can't cover the 198, but they could cover some fraction of it. And then the town covers a smaller portion of it. And I guess I just feel like I don't know, maybe others do and others can fill me in on that, but I feel like I just don't know what that process since May has, has been. Yeah, I, I don't have a precise answer to that. I, Dan, I, I, I do think that your suspicion that, you know, because it was known that the money would be available, not a lot of effort was put into trying to work out a deal. I. I think that that is likely the situation. Having not heard otherwise, anything other, you know, to, to, I haven't heard there's been meetings and this is what we tried to do and we couldn't come to agreement. I mean, nothing like that. It's just, well, we've got money, let's spend it on this. Well, I, I would enhance that with one of the parameters is, is, is water or water supply or clean drinking water because we hear enough in the news of Flint, Michigan, uh, not Sherburn, Massachusetts. Um, but we're kind of in that Flint category right now. And we have an elderly housing that can afford it. I, I, I heard um, uh, elderly housing say, yes, we'll contribute. And the um, uh, Leland Farm uh, market rate and subsidized rate, though it's, it's, it's very skewed towards the subsidized, saying uh, we ain't got money. Um, and, and again, I, I just go back to it. It seems, yes, it's the first one on the gate, and maybe they knew that it was you know, money there, because I remember asking how much are we getting from the boondoggle, and it was one point something million. Jeff, Jeff Waldron had that number. Um, and, and how were we going to use that? And I'm glad that the, the federal government gave us some uh, parameters to use it for. Um, but 
gosh, you know, approaching uh, residency at uh, Woodland, uh, Woodhaven now in, in my advanced stages, um, maybe I'm biased and um, think it is a good use of the federal funds given all of, and I'm repeating myself, uh, the past history. Brendan and Steve, I haven't heard from you guys yet. I hear what you think. My, own, I guess my con my concern here. I'll, I will concur with Jane that um, I still don't know that the town has made any effort to negotiate with the residents because it, w it did seem clear to me that this is not a legal obligation of the town, and therefore we would be asking the town. Initially, we're asking the town, all town residents, to take on the burden of a select few town residents. That's one. Then, two separately with this ARPA, um, I guess. I'm certainly far from the expert, but um, I just don't want, uh, I don't want to spend the money on something and ARPA comes back later and says, nah, that wasn't actually related to, or, or falls under the category of what you should spend money on. You seem to have had a water problem at your residences here in town that the town decided to spend these ARC, ARPA funds on. And so um, I've got two issues with this. One, again, I don't know, the town should be spending this money anyway. And two, even though this is not formally coming from the town, it's the town's responsibility to spend this ARPA money correctly. And I just, <laughs> again, I just am not, it's not clear to me that this need falls under the use of funds that has been provided. And so maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong there and someone can say, hey, definitively, yes, this need for water remediation project at Woodhaven and Leland is very clearly under the rules of ARPA engagement. Okay, then that resolves one of the problems for me and I'm, I'm far more likely to vote in favor. Um, as I said, I did run it by the consultant and you know that's part of her job is to review all these to make sure that they fit in the guidelines as she, as she sees them. And she did say that it, it does fit in the guidelines. Thank, I mean, thank you, Deb. That, that helps me greatly. Um, and you know, then, then I will actually, with that, with that information in hand, um, I would say that while I share Jane's concern um, that this is not formally a cost or shouldn't formally be a cost to the town, um, sometimes you get lucky. And sometimes when you get lucky with finances, you need to do the thing that, that needs to be done. Uh, and so knowing now what, what Deb has clarified for me, I'm going to vote in favor of this. Brendan, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of it. The, the one sentence in there that says they put in a request for Fed funds for infrastructure, and if we get those approved, we'll not use the ARPA funds. Like, I'm just wondering if they've got the order of operations wrong. Like, mm -hmm. should they wait to see if they get the Fed funds before they submit this? Um, at the same time, though, like it looks like this has been vetted. It's been through select board. Um, you know, this is a sort of public safety thing. I would hate to be the one to hold this up and, and you know have people be drinking bad water for six more months because we failed to vote on this. So I, I, I'm in favor of it. I do have reservations, but um, I, I would vote yes. Um, Brendan, if we do get the federal funds, we don't have to use the ARPA money. Do you know when we'll find out about the federal funds? I, I don't, I don't. But we don't really like submit, uh, you know, our forms until, until this money is spent. And they're not actually, you know, they wanna do the engineering right now, but they're not gonna do the construction until spring of 2022. So it'll be a little while before the money is actually spent. On the infrastructure funds, I think this is tied with uh legislation right that we've all been reading hearing about in the news with the infrastructure the bipartisan infrastructure bill and while that just passed the senate that still has a long process ahead so that's going to be november december maybe even january probably before that's done if it gets done unless unless there's a different pot of infrastructure money that this is referring to Uh, Natalie, I don't remember if you have weighed in yet on with your opinion on this. Oh, I guess if it's, if you know that ARPA money will pay for this, 
I guess we should just go do it because it is public safety. The, the state has said somebody has to do something. But I, my reservation is with Jane that we're setting a precedent that their problem is our problem. And I'm, you know, and that's not, you know, not entirely true. But I guess I'd vote if it's free money, go and take it and fix it. Uh, Heidi? Um, I just want to bring up, I have since found out that I will have a difficult time trying to bond this where the town had voted to borrow the money. Um, and then we'd be getting reimbursed for debt service being paid by this. When I brought it up to bond council trying to get this um, vetted, they want to see all kinds of contracts, agreements. Um, it may have to go through a tax attorney because there's a question of whether some are private parties versus public parties. And I might actually have to do two bonds, a taxable bond and a non-taxable bond. It's becoming actually quite a hornet's nest. So just an FYI, this would be great for me. Not well, no can't, to work, but... Heidi, Heidi, can't we can't we float this on short-term bans? Um... Pans, um, we, all we, of those. We, 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 we may have to. I was trying to put it in the long-term bond issue because of the money was going to be cheap and putting it over the 10 years. Um, right. Well, this, this is the cheapest source. It, it is right now, but there are times when actually bonds, the short-term market has gone higher than the long-term market before, you know, like five years no, no, ago. No, no, no. This is free. This is oh, free. Oh, right. No, that's why I'm, I'm kind of saying I'm in favor of this because... I found out that the traditional bond way, how we were going to look at financing that the way the town voted is going to be very, very difficult and actually might cost us more money. So this, this would be great. Well, that, well that, that, that I, that I vote for it. If it's going to cost us more money to make Leland pay for their own water, then that doesn't make any sense. So I guess yeah. I, I vote yeah. for taking, you know, taking the free money. Right, and especially because if we get federal funds, then the other ARPA, it'll free up more ARPA funds for something else. What do you mean federal funds? Now I'm confused. They're applying for some federal grants for this as well. Oh, okay, okay. So we vote to pay for it out of ARPA. That's what we're voting for tonight. But then if we get a grant, then we're not gonna pay for it out of ARPA. Is that what you said? Well, or you get, yeah. or some money, the grant might be for $50,000. We, you know, we don't, I don't, for an example, I don't know, but it just, okay. that's, that's what they're writing up that they will not, if they get the grants, they will not have to use opera funds, but you don't okay. know how long it takes to get the grants and if you get them. So if we vote to do this with ARPA funds, then we've earmarked some of those funds and we can't give them to anybody else until those grants come through. That would be correct, I believe, Deb. Okay. Deb could answer that one probably yeah, more. Yes, that, that... Yeah, that okay. sounds correct. But the funds are available till 2024, I think. So it could yeah, be, they have to be spent recycled. by 2024. Right. Yeah. So it might be recycled by 2024. We should hopefully know if we've gotten the grants. All right. But we've got to make sure that we don't give this money away to somebody else. Because if you don't get the grants, we have to still have it then. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, until we got any federal grant money, then this this money is spent and gone. Would it uh, would it really gum up the works and and mess things up if this were deferred to the next meeting with uh, learn some more about how much effort was really made and whether there might be some portion of this that they could reasonably come up with, even if they can't come up with the full 198,000? Um, I think that they were trying to get some engineering um, work done as soon as possible. But like I said, based on what they submitted, they're not gonna do the construction until spring of 2022. So I don't think another two weeks would probably make any difference. I think it's, it sounds like with engineering, yeah, it's going to cost more to try to get them to pay for it. I, I, I think it, I, I, Deb or Heidi, is that, is that the right way to think about it? That it's going to cost more to have them pay for it? 
it it would cost us more if we had to borrow it and go through and pay a tax attorney and, fi and do two different bonds and a tax exempt bond or non-tax exempt bond. There would be a, a, a little bit more cost. Um, and I don't know what's involved with if legal counsel is involved with trying to negotiate. We do would have costs with legal counsel trying to negotiate right now. That's not reflected here at the 198. Um, it's clearly a use that the federal funds want to be used for. And you know, we do have 1.2 million. This is a chunk, but it's a, a good project where the it's, it's still a town owned water system. And I believe if, if, if Woodhaven and Leland, if we force them to get together and figure out, okay, what is the amount that they can afford and they come up with, um, they can, they can pay for half of it. That, that doesn't, I don't think that's, that makes Heidi's job just as complicated, right, Heidi? Because you, you'd still go through all those same problem issues just for right. an amount of 100,000 instead of 200,000. Right, right. It's, it's, yeah, it's just, there's, it's just some technical glitches with the contracts and the type of people that this is servicing that makes it an unusual item to borrow for. And, and actually, I look at it and say, then it's really small amount of money to borrow to go through the hassles. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, and I, Jane, I totally hear your arguments, um, but I, I also, I feel like this is one of those scenarios where, where, where maybe we, we relax our mandate to pinch every penny, you know, because uh, it does it does seem like there is pretty broad support for um, paying for this project uh, using the ARPA money. Um, um, and it, uh, it makes a lot of people's lives easier and it uh, uh, gets this project moving in a mo the most expedient manner. Um, so I am, I am sympathetic to your position, but I, believe that I, I would vote in favor of this as well. Can I make uh, a suggestion on how the vote might be crafted? Um, because we've discussed possible grants, we've discussed possible, you know, infrastructure money that we might have access to later. If our, if, if the vote could somehow be contingent on, you know, approval to pay with the ARPA funds, um, you know, if, if there is no other funding available through grants, through, you know, other federal aid. In other words, I, it, such that our vote would not make it easy for people to just use this money without even trying to, you know, get another source of grants or, you know, or other money. But I think they've already applied for the grants. Or do you mean? In they, the I mean, is that is that already been applied yeah. for and it's pending? Yeah, it says it says we have also put in a request. Okay. So they've already put in for the grant, and they're just waiting all right. for well, it. Well, then all the more reason though why I would word the vote that way because, you know, this the the grant. I mean, I should read. Does this say we won't use this if we get the grant? Correct. It says if we get it, we will not use the ARPA funds. Okay. Then I'm, that, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, my, my guess is that the 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 time sensitive nature of this is that they want to get the engineering done now. So, so at at minimum, some amount of this is going to get spent immediately once they give the green light to the engineers to basically design this whole system and get it ready to go. Which is the reason why we can't just wait to find out what the federal government does before we make a decision on this, because that that puts the entire project in a holding pattern yeah and that's you know um all right are we okay to to bring this to a vote all right no more no more last call for additional comments um all right can i get a uh motion with respect to this uh ARPA fund request for use of ARPA funds um, for the Woodhaven Leland combined water system in the amount of $198,000. So moved. 
Wait, can you, what, what do you move? Uh, I move for positive, I guess the term would be po for positive action, uh, similar to approval, what we do at, at town meeting. I think you would just say move, move to approve the request. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I move to approve this request for use of $198,000 of ARPA funds um, for the project named Woodhand, Woodhaven Leland Combined Water System. Second. All right, you've changed positions on the screen. So now Brendan Daly, you're first. Aye. Jane Matarazzo. Nay. Steve Lay. Aye. Peter Galatano. Aye. Natalie Weir. Aye. Dan Sickle. Nay. Mark Albers. Aye. And I'm an I. So uh, the request is approved by a vote of six to two. Um, Dad, do you know, uh, can I sign this electronically and send it back to you? Or does this, this, does, this doesn't need to be a, a, a pen, an ink signature, does it? No, you can go ahead and, and sign it electronically. Right. Again, it's really a, an internal uh, form at this point. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Oh my God, it's 10 o'clock. All right. Uh, I think we should say for Dan's benefit that the meetings aren't usually this bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're much easier most of the time. <laughs> I've been involved in lots of different organizations. This is not this is not bad. When um, we were in person, we would go to midnight, you guys. Don't don't lull them into a false sense of that's because we had whiskey. Uh, only only on occasion would we go late. That's usually in the late spring as the budgets are getting finalized, Dan. Yeah, the budgets uh yeah. Um, all right, so on the agenda, I've got two more uh, items, um, guidance and then minutes. I'm gonna propose that at the very least, the 20 page minutes we push off to the next meeting. Um, maybe we can quick approve the, uh, the shorter minutes. Guidance, um, um, I don't wanna get into a deep um, discussion. I just wanna start introducing some um, ideas. Um, so the previous, essentially every year I've been on advisory, the guidance has been um, level budget and then uh, some amount for COLA based somewhat on personnel board's recommendation, which has been, I believe 2% every year, unless it was 2.5% um, one particular year. Um, I, I think that this past year, we started to run a little bit off the rails with that um, annual um, guidance. Uh, mainly revolving around the what to do about um, town buildings question, uh, because, uh, you know, we keep telling him to stop putting um, maintenance into the capital for town buildings. Um, but then meanwhile, we're giving him guidance of uh, level guidance for town buildings. So we're essentially just telling him don't, don't maintain the buildings. Um, so that's 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 kind of like one of the ideas that I wanted to put out there is that um, we, we may want to actually <clears throat> every year we talk about should we customize um, our guidance for each of the larger departments based on what we actually want them to do. Um, and so that's a, a thing that that I think we should all think about. Um, I don't know if anybody has any brief comments that they want to make about guidance this year. Can I just ask a quick question, Steve? We know we had a massive overage last year of to the tune of what 1.135 million or 1.35 million yeah it's like 1.1 something yeah what are we doing with that money is that just going back to the taxpayers is that going to fund opeb what is there a plan of attack for that is that going to be a completely separate discussion in in my mind that means that there's one there's an extra 1.1 something million dollars sitting in the cash cash flow uh, yeah free cash yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes into our free cash. Um, I do think that that is a discussion for another time Agreed. as to what to do with it. Because I, 
one of the things that I want to do this fall um, is have a broader discussion about OPEB and what we are or are not doing about OPEB and what we should or should not do about OPEB. Um, I think that's it's not we're not going to talk about that tonight, but I, I think that's certainly one of the things that that we may decide to do is put more money into OPEB. Um, okay. And just for so so Dan's aware, Dan, you may or may not be aware. Essentially, with with the onset of COVID and all the budgeting stuff last year, the town, the feds told all the departments to budget extra. Our expenses came in far lower than what had been budgeted. Now, therefore, there's an extra one point one sitting around which a kind of rule of thumb is basically every $13,000 spent is about a penny on the tax rate. And so um, that 1.1 million, and this is too simplistic, but if returned to the townspeople, that'd be a significant drop in our tax rate. So yeah, you, you'll hear me talk about that a lot over the coming year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And it also makes a guidance of level budget a little bit tricky because level budget was a million dollars over last year, but then that year's a very odd year and we can't assume that what worked last year is gonna work next year. Well, maybe it will, because I don't, I don't know how COVID's gonna go in the next year. It's gonna be a, a challenging thing because nobody can predict um, how next year is going to look compared to last year and the year before. Um, and it's gonna Steve, make our guidance comments. tricky. Yep, go ahead, Peter. One, one, one brief comment I, I would have is let's, uh, and we've done this in a few years in the past, revert uh, more heavily to data-driven um, trends, uh, especially with the uh, roller coaster we've been on over the last three years. And now I believe we're fully implemented on VADAR. So those reports should be uh, readily available to be digested and would help with that customized guidance that you touched upon at the beginning that the four big departments police um, uh, dpw buildings and um, uh, fire uh, may have more enhanced guidance than the smaller departments that's that's my suggestion yeah schools too i don't know what um the schools are always tricky right because um because they, they always have more money than they need <laughs> and uh it's hard to find it <laughs> and this last year there were they had to turn back several hundred thousand dollars to the town right because they filled up they filled up all their pockets and they couldn't they couldn't fit any more in um it's a good point, Steve. I mean, I do think it's worth considering that the pinata, if you will, I mean, Dan, that's sort of like the extra pot of money that we think we might have available, but uh, um, we don't necessarily assume it's spent, but it will get spent. <laughs> um, but I think it might be worth considering that the pinata, whatever we decide it is this year, is actually probably significantly larger because of all the COVID related money that's out there. It, do you know what I mean? Like the schools, the schools have their own separate, um, you know, funds that they have access to. The town has access to this extra 1.2. I mean, you know, there, there is extra money out there. So I think we should keep that in mind when people, um, you know, say they're desperate for this, that, or the other thing there, you know, there are some other funding sources out there this year. Another thing we may want to do is also turn the screws a little bit on the assessors. Um, you know, I think pretty prominently real estate has been skyrocketing over the past year. I don't know how that is necessarily going to affect our um, town valuation, but I would assume that the new home sales have generally been significantly um, higher than, than they had been in previous years. So that could also actually um, uh, affect the amount of, of revenue that we generate. Um, so that, I think that's something that we had also been discussing in um, several previous years is that there's a bunch of new development coming through that uh, probably a bunch of revenue is about to come through and we can, we should, you know, um, tighten the belts, tighten the belts, and then 
um, two or three years from now, the departments can start to really expand the services the way that they think they really want to. Um, I don't I don't know if uh, next year is the year that we start doing that, or is it the year after that? I don't I don't know if we're still in a tighten the belt as much as possible um, phase, or if we are starting into a okay, we have a bunch of money that is pooling up, and now let's find um, good ways to spend it. I don't know the answer to that, but. These are things that, that we should think about. Or, or alternatively, use all of that extra money to decrease the tax rate, which I think is also a reasonable strategy. And I'd love to know more about, you know, the reasonable time frame for the Coolidge project, because that's, <laughs> you know, potentially a, a lot of money that could be a game changer. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, we keep hearing about a, a likely fall town meeting. It's basically for that Coolidge project, but I haven't heard anything more as to um, that next step, which is the inter municipal agreement um, actually moving forward. So, um, so I think we just have to keep waiting and seeing on that one. Um, but anyway, these are the higher level things that I want everybody to be thinking about with regard to um, guidance as we move on to our next couple of meetings. Um, and unless anybody had more comments they desperately wanted to make about guidance, um, I would propose that we approve some of these minutes. All right. I believe the earliest one that I had was, was it April 7th? All right, I got April 7, May 5 and July 15. Um, let's do those because I think they'll be hopefully relatively straightforward. Steve, I just, I, I don't know about April 7th because I, I wasn't the drafter of those. The other two, the more recent meetings. Yeah. Um, if I read David Williams's um, email correctly today, he does not want us to list as participants anyone other than the actual committee members. And in oh, both, both of the recent um, meetings that I drafted, I did have some other names in there. So we should probably amend those to take those names out. Yeah. And I also just realized that this uh, April 7th one is an executive session. So I don't think that we can approve these in open meeting. I think we need to discuss these in an executive session. So I'm going to show that one. All right. To May 5. Um, okay. So, so I think for this one, because um, Recreation Commission was an actual That was the purpose of this meeting. So I think they should go on the list of of people present. Is that does that seem right, Jane? I mean, I guess so. I, I David seemed to be more sensitive about other town employees. So maybe we take out David Williams and Jackie yeah, and just, Heidi. Yeah. I'll take them out. All right. All right, any, uh, any edits to these? All right, can I get a motion to approve these uh, minutes of May 5th, 2021 as, as amended on screen? So moved. Second. Uh, all right, uh, let's vote. Brendan Daly? Aye. Jane? Aye. Steve? Aye. Peter? Aye. Dan. 
Uh, aye. Uh, and Mark. Aye. Great. Hey, real quick, Steve. Um, can Dan vote on that uh, since he was not there? Yeah. Yeah. You are. You are allowed to vote on minutes okay. even if you're Good not second. there. Okay. That was, that, was the, that was one of the weird rules I remember from like one of my first days on advisory. If it makes more sense for me to abstain, happy to do that. Just whatever, whatever is easiest, you know, and works best. Yeah. And, and certainly, no offense, meant Dan. We're just being no. procedural here. No. No. Yeah. No. I mean, I read over them; it all made sense. Didn't even didn't even find any missing periods or anything, you know. So <laughs> I was I was good. Yeah, I think the I, I think the reasoning is because if you have a lot of turnover on the committee, that it, it is possible you're approving minutes from the last meeting, and you don't even have a quorum present of the the people that were present at the meeting. If that makes sense. You know, because if we if we lost six advisory members and there was only three left, then you would never have enough of a quorum to uh, to approve um, last year's minutes. All right, with this one actually after my draft on the other one. We also, uh, wait, this was a joint meeting with select board. So I think it's probably legit to add the select board members. And then I would eliminate these town employees, right? All right. All right. No uh, edits. All right. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of July 15, 2021, as edited on screen? So moved. Second. All right. Let's vote. Brendan? Aye. Jane? Aye. Steve? Aye. Peter? Aye. Uh, Dan? Aye. And Mark? Aye. All right, great. These are approved. Um, can we set our next meeting date for four weeks from now? That would be one, two, three, four, September 8th. Same bat time, same bat place. Uh, all right, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, looks like we already lost Peter. Um, all right, uh, Brendan? Jane? Aye. Steve? Aye. Dan? Aye. Oh, no, wait, there's Peter. Peter? Aye. And Mark. Hi. All right. 1021, we are adjourned. Thank you for sitting through a long Thank first you. meeting. Thanks, folks. Yeah. Welcome, right. Dan. Take care. See you in a month. Good to see you soon, guys. All right.